What we'll do now then is run through a paired t test, which you'll sometimes also see referred to as within subjects or repeated measures. They all mean the same thing. It just means that we're rather than looking at group separate groups of individuals now, each participant takes part in both conditions. So an, an example of this is, imagine we took the same kind of research design and Dr. S. Lumber wanted to repeat this experiment, but this time she couldn't find very many students. She could only find 20 students to take part. If this was an independent t-test then, we'd be looking at 10 students per group, which is bordering on quite low in terms of sample size. So she decided to do a uh, within subjects t-test on this. And one of the advantages of this type of design is that you do have, if you've got small samples, you do have increased power in a within subjects design to detect any effects. She took 20 students then, and this time all participants took part in both conditions. So on one exam, participants were allowed to sleep, and on another exam, they were kept awake all night. The experiment was counterbalanced so that on the first night of the first exam, the first 10 students were forced to stay up. And on the night of the second exam, the last 10 students were forced to stay up. So they all had, they all took part in both of these conditions. What we can do now then is go into SPSS. And the first consideration that you need to take into account is if you've got a uh, within subjects design where each participant's uh, tested on more than once, the data needs to be organized in SPSS slightly differently for SPSS to know what to do with it. So this time, rather than have, we, you can see we don't have any kind of grouping variable because we haven't got any groups. So that kind of makes sense. What we do have this time is two columns representing this time one of each of the conditions. So this is the sleep condition where they had a full night's sleep. And this is the no sleep condition where they were kept up all night. So this time the independent variable, if you like, is represented the group, each of the groups is represented by a separate column. And then within these columns, the data points themselves represent the score on the dependent variable. You'll see if you'll go into analyze compare means and then paired samples t-test this time. You'll see that if you organize your data in this way, then all you need to do in this paired samples box is to move the first um, condition over to this box, move the second over to the next box, and then click on OK. And then it will give you everything you need up in the output. And if we get the output up, what we'll do first of all, uh, as with last time, is just check the mean scores. We can see that the participants who, when they took part in the sleep condition, they were scoring on average 65.38. And when they took part in the no sleep condition, they were scoring a mean of 60.22. So like the example before, it looks like there's a difference in the predicted direction that the participants, when they could get sleep, were doing better in the exam. What you can do then is just look at this next table. This is called paired samples correlations. This calculates a correlation between the individual's two data points. So if you like, what we'd expect is that someone's score for their first condition will be correlated or associated with their score in the second condition, simply because people who are doing very well on the first exam are likely to be doing very well on the second exam, regardless really of what condition they're in. And this is why we can't use an independent design for this type of study, because the data points will be associated. So they won't be truly independent data points. We'd expect an association to be occurring here. And in fact, this is what we found for this example, where the data was the data between the two conditions was correlated at 0.664, which was significant. But we don't need to worry too much about that. We'll go on now to the next table, paired samples test, 
which, is, which gives us the results of the t-test. And you'll notice that the bits that you really need are now at the end of this test. You could have a look at the first column, which is the mean, which this time is the mean difference between the two conditions. So we know that the two conditions differed by 5.16. But we'll have a look now at the, first of all, T statistic and the degrees of freedom. Uh, so the degrees of freedom for this is 19, so it's one less than the number of participants in total. The T statistic was 2.76. The p-value was 0 0.012, so there was a significant difference between the two conditions. Like before, again, we can add Cohen's d as a measure of effect size. And the mean scores for condition one and condition two this time were 65.38 and 60.22, which gives us a difference of 5.16. Divide this by the standard deviation again for the sleep group, and this will give us Cohen's D. Two things to note here is that, first of all, the difference between the two conditions was slightly less than what we had before when we did the independent t-test. And in addition, the standard deviation is slightly higher than what we had before for the two groups as well. Now, this isn't anything to do with the repeated measures or paired samples t-test, this is just reflects the fact that this is different data and is always going to be slightly different to what we had before, depending on the participants we get. So there's nothing to do with the test. It's just to illustrate that the effect this has for both of these, both a reduced mean difference and an increased standard deviation, reflecting more variability between, between participants. This has the effect of reducing then the Cohen's D effect size. So it's now 0 0.56. We'll just finish off by going through how to interpret this Cohen's D then. So that time we got uh, effect size of 0.56, which would represent a medium effect. And then before in the independent t-test, we had a Cohen's D of uh, just over one. So that would represent a large effect. So if we get a Cohen's D of 0 0.50, then that's representing the fact that the standard, the difference between the groups represents half of a standard deviation. So not as much as before, but fairly substantial in terms of the difference. And then if you've got a Cohen's D of around about 0 0.20, this is considered a small effect. And you can think that this basically represents the fact that the difference between the groups is now a one-fifth of the standard deviation. So we're getting on to quite small differences at this point. But Jacob Cohen, who came up with Cohen's D, has given us these guidelines for interpretation in terms of what represents a small, medium, and large effect. But one word of warning he gave with this is that these should be considered kind of loose guidelines, really. These are not hard and fast rules, and it all depends on the types of studies you're doing, uh, what, you've, what previous research has found, and uh, considerations such as whether a small sample size might have just led to a spuriously large effect size. So you need to be cautious in interpretation, but these do provide quite handy guidance just to give you an idea of how big your effect in terms of the difference between the groups might actually be. So one just one final note on reporting. You can report a paired t-test in pretty much the same way as you reported the independent t-test. The only thing really to take into account are the uh, changes in the degrees of freedom, i.e. we're just doing the total sample minus one this time. But other than that, as long as you've got the test statistics, including an effect size, you want the mean scores and standard deviations in there and an interpretation, brief interpretation of what this means. So when participants took part in the sleep condition, they gained higher exam scores than when they took part in the no sleep condition. And this represents a medium effect size.